Well, good morning. I'm so glad that you're able to, to join us here. And as we enter into this next week, I want to give you some suggestions on, well, how we navigate something that we've not really ever done before. We've never not been here for Palm Sunday. We've never not been here for Easter. But those things are coming. And so today, being Palm Sunday, the day that we would celebrate and recognize Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the last week before, well, before the Lord secured salvation for you and me, we need to take this week and make it a time of special reflection. Oh, and when I say time, I know you've got it because you have more time now than you have in the past, and in this case, in this time. And I believe that God wants to do something in the hearts and minds of his people as we would take and we would reverend this week, this time, this holy week. And so I want to encourage you that you would take and you would start by not today and not in the next few minutes. We're going to go into our normal study this morning and you'll see why. But you need to jump forward after today and throughout the course of the week to Luke chapter 19. And you need to read there through this aspect of the triumphal entry, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, and then up into and leading into the crucifixion and the resurrection. This will be great preparation for next week. The other thing that I want you to prepare for, and this is going to be another one of those things, we don't know exactly how it's going to work, but it will because we'll do it with the right intentions before the Lord. We're going to do communion next week. Well, we're going to do it here with a few folks, less than 10 or 10 or less, and we want you to be prepared to do that at home as well. Not in the sense of worrying about going out and having the right specific stuff. If you've got crackers and juice, you're in good shape. Whatever you would choose to do it with it, it's the heart that goes before the Lord as we would look for common union with Him. So I want you to prepare this week in preparation for next as we would look at and recognize the reason that we can stand worshiping a marvelous God because of the sacrifice, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you to do so. Other than that, we are continuing to just, uh, well, live in place more than anything else. And I'm still very, very encouraged by what I'm seeing happening within the body through the communications and through the encouragement that is there. So I want you to continue to do that. If you've got your Bibles with you, and you should, if not, I'll know, you need to turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. Luke, chapter 12. Let's ask the Lord to bless this time of Bible study. Lord, we come before you, and Lord, we ask that you would just settle our hearts and our minds to receive all that you have for us today. Lord, we don't want to leave anything out. We don't want to be distracted by anything that could possibly come against us at this point in time, Lord. And so we ask that even now, as we would prepare our hearts in, in, in doing church collectively, but in our homes, oh Lord, that you would be the master of all of your house, of our house, of our hearts collectively as we come together as a body of believers. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can do so knowing that you always hear us when we pray. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're in about the midpoint of Luke's gospel. And what we see here are the recorded words of Jesus. And I, and I love the red sections of the Bible. You, you may or may not have a Bible that puts the words of Christ in red, but you've seen one, hopefully, and if not, well, just know that when, when Jesus speaks, certain translations will take and make sure that those words are in red. And I like that. I like it because we realize that there's a distinct importance and even a value to the things that Christ has spoken personally to us. Now, understand that it's not a matter of the Bible in any way, shape, or form being less, we know that it's the infallible Word of God. We know that God inspired it and man recorded it as he directed. 2 Timothy 3 and 16 tells us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and for instruction in righteousness. So we, we know that there's no separation in relationship to it being God's Word, but the red letter sections are the actual words recorded, the quotes of Jesus. They give us insight into his personality and his character. And so I love that part. Jesus right now is in full ministry mode. His popularity is, is going through the roof. And as too is the opposition to the things that he's saying. He's currently engaged in, well, we could call it a discussion, but it's really more of an argument. He's arguing with the Pharisees and the lawyers. 
they have become very frustrated at their efforts to try to trip him up and not being able to do so. They've resorted to just name-calling and just plain meanness. It's, well, it's kind of like a White House press conference. These guys are continually trying to create that gotcha moment. And Jesus, on the other hand, has called them out by identifying that their motives are both wicked and greedy. And so here's where we pick up the account in chapter 12, verse 1. It says, In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, First of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, get the picture. There's a massive group of people here, and there's nothing that creates controversy and, and draws people in than an argument between the powers, if you will. And Jesus turns to his guys. He doesn't say this to the masses. He turns to his guys, it says, first, and he said, watch out for the Pharisees because these guys are major hypocrites. Jesus uses an example. He uses the example of leaven. And we know that leaven is, of course, yeast. It's what would go into a dough in order to be able to cause it to rise. And the reason that it rises is because it's starting a chemical reaction that really starts rotting the dough. And so this aspect of what we see here and what's taking place is the perfect example of what happens in a life where sin has permeated, where just a little bit of sin can enter into a life, and before we know it, it has taken and consumed the entirety of that life. Now the main problem with hypocrisy is that it would come in the form of a wrong or selfish motive. It would have a personal agenda, and hypocrisy in its most damaging is driven by personal ambition or gain. This is why Jesus himself referred to and talked about the problem that the Pharisees and the lawyers were having was that which was driven by wickedness in their heart and by a desire for greed. You see, they were using their position, their authority, to promote and further their own agendas and their own personal wealth. Now, I'm glad that we don't see this thing happening today in and amongst our leaders, both religious and political, but then again, maybe we do. So here's a picture. Jesus says these guys are supposed to lead the people. These guys are supposed to be those that are bringing them into the things of God and doing so in such a way that they're receiving the blessings of God. But instead, they're serving themselves. Instead, they're looking out for their own interest and advancing themselves. Beware of this kind of activity. Beware of this kind of hypocrisy because it's not of me and it's not of my Father. Now, I wish it wasn't true. I wish it wasn't true, but one of the biggest criticisms within the church today is that it's full of and filled with people that are hypocrites, right? Well, not today, everybody that's here. But those of you, the few that are here, you guys are all hypocrites. You should know that. But the problem is, and this is a news flash, and it's not fake news, it's real news, the entire world is full of hypocrites. You see, the problem is not unique to the church. The problem is found in people. And so the problem isn't that there are hypocrites in the church by virtue of going to church. The problem is, is that because there is a church and people go there, the hypocrites show up. You see, it's wherever they happen to be. The problem has nothing to do with following the teachings of Jesus Christ. In fact, the church, being the people of God, if they are truly following the teachings of Jesus Christ, then hypocrisy winds up being replaced with humility. But it's a process. It's a process that requires sanctification. It requires first an acceptance and an acknowledgement of Jesus as Lord, and then a yielding in our lives to the Spirit of God, which would allow us to replace this aspect of judgment with true and godly humility. See, the problem, again, has nothing to do with what Jesus teaches, but it has with people wanting to self-promote or potentially apply a standard to others that they themselves have not yet or cannot achieve. But again, if we are ever going to overcome hypocrisy, you need to listen to this because it's true. The church is filled with hypocrites, but it's the only place I know where you can go to overcome hypocrisy with humility. 
Understand that the world is always going to view any opinion that opposes sin, any aspect that would come against the will of man as hypocrisy. It's going to look in the form of trying to justify sin as a means of being able to say that God's standards or God's people are unfair and they're holding to this position of doing that which they are saying that which they don't really do. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Christ wants us to be open. He wants us to be transparent. He wants us to be who we are in Him. He doesn't want us to put on an appearance. He doesn't want us to dress up to come to church if that's not who we are. He wants us to, to be honest and to be open first with Him and then with everyone else that we would see. And guys, understand, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect, but we can do our best to serve the one who was, because there is only one, and that's Jesus himself. And the heart of his perfection is found in love and mercy and grace, but also it's found in judgment and in righteousness. Our part? Our part is to love God with all that we are to do everything that we can to turn ourselves and our lives over to the direction and the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Lord tells us that as we would love Him with all we are and love others as ourselves, that there's no law against it. There's no hypocrisy within that. And our prayer should always be that we would trade hypocrisy for humility. Verse 2 says, There's nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And whatever you've spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. Wow, what a scary thought, huh? Nothing's going to be hidden. Jesus goes on to say that hypocrisy can't be hidden. While you might be able to conceal it for a while, first off, understand, God sees everything. And in time, so will others. You can only keep a secret a secret so long before it comes to life, especially for those who know the Lord. <sighs> you see, the Lord's not going to allow His children. And this is one of the things that I, I really enjoy talking to people who have come to a relationship with the Lord and then struggle with understanding just how much God cares. You've got to realize that God has now brought you into the place of being His child and how important that is and because you now have accepted jesus christ and you've placed him in the position of lordship over your life it means that now you've granted god permission over your life it doesn't belong to you anymore it belongs to him and because it belongs to him then there's a certain responsibility a certain releasing to him that goes along with that god says that those that he loves he chastens now when I'm out in a public place, when I'm out in stores, and not lately, but before, when I would be out in these places and I would see a child acting out or a child doing something that was, that was wrong, it was misbehaving, right? And you look, and right within close proximity is that child's parents, right? At that particular point in time, my options are greatly limited. I mean, the most I can do is maybe look at the child with that, you know, you, you need to stop look. But that's about as far as you can go. Because as long as the parents are there, and they're the ones that are responsible for that child, then I really don't have any opportunity to be able to do something to correct that situation. It's just not how it works. As much as I might want to. Actually, my heart normally goes more to wanting to correct the parent. But the reality is, is that when we come to God and we say, Lord... We want to accept your terms of salvation. We want to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Everything that I am, everything that I'm not, all that I hope to be, everything that, that I possess, I now give to you in order to attain salvation. You've got it all. I'm yours. You've got me. Then what we've just done is we have just assigned ourselves to him, and God takes that role very seriously. He takes it so seriously that he's not going to let us get away with things. Just like if that's my child in the store, I'm not going to let them get away with that. If my child is the one that is misbehaving because I have a responsibility in love to my child to see that they do the best and, and are taught the best and carry out this aspect of being properly behaved in, re in relationship to their circumstances, I'm going to intervene. I'm going to step up. And guys, this is what you need to understand. God's not going to let you get away with the stuff that you think you're doing in the dark. 
He's not going to let you get away with the secrets that you believe are concealed. They're not concealed from Him. And at some point in time, and it's always somewhat so shocking when somebody who appeared to be so together stumbles and falls so far based on the secrets that they maintained in their lives thinking that somehow or another that God would not bring it to light. And verse 4 says, And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Now, it's interesting because we know that we're told over and over and over and over again in God's word that we're not supposed to be afraid. But yet here Jesus himself is saying, hey, there's something that should drive your life. There's something that should be the compelling force in your life. And if you're going to be compelled to have any type of fear in your life that's going to direct you and cause you to be able to go in the right direction, that fear needs to be of God and not man. You need to fear God. And we know, of course, the beginning of wisdom comes with the fear of the Lord. Man has really the ability to only kill us in the body oh now i know that's not a happy thought that's not something that we want to like walk into and just say oh yeah this is great no but the reality is is that we shouldn't have a fear of that which doesn't have an eternal aspect in relationship to what's happening and so often we make so many decisions and even bad decisions based on our fear of man a fear of what man can do or especially what man will think of us Oh, man, I don't want them to think that I'm this, or I don't want them to think that I'm that. And so, therefore, I start changing my behaviors in such a way that I start, start trying to obscure who I should be in Christ in relationship to what I want to present to them so that they won't be in a position not just to be offended, but not like me. Yet, we should never fear the outcome of not pleasing man. Because there is nothing that anyone can do to us that is beyond the power of God's salvation and beyond His hand upon us. Are there not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Let me read that again. Are there not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs on your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. Jesus turns and he talks about the least of things, if you will. Sparrows were considered to be worthless birds. They really weren't worth it. You can get two for a penny and you can get five for, for two cents. I mean, the, 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 they weren't of any value. And so Jesus says, if you, if you think about the most unvalued thing in our culture, these little birds, God doesn't miss a single one of them. He knows everyone. As a matter of fact, if that's not something that gives you an indication of how significant you are, He knows every hair on your head. I googled it. Most people have around 100,000 hairs on their head. A few of you that I see right now are excluded from that number. Well, at least one of you. It, it's a matter of understanding that God cares so much about us that He knows us so intimately that not even something as, as, as simple as the hair on our head passes without Him noticing. I mean, how many times do we wonder if God is even there? How many times do we, do we think, God, how come you're not listening? Or how come you're not hearing me? Or even more so, how come I can't hear you? And folks, we need to understand that God is always right there. He's close to us in that nothing escapes, not even the loss of a hair from our head. And knowing this should change the way we live. If we truly fear God by virtue of reverencing and understanding His, His aspect of being all-powerful, then there should be this, this understanding that we don't need to worry about anything. 
Everywhere we go, God is watching. Everything we do, He is aware of. Every hair on our head, He knows. What then can man do to us? What then can anything on this earth come in any meaningful way against us? Now, I love the fact that over the years in watching our children grow up, that there's something that happens in the presence of their mom and dad. Kids become just totally unaware of danger when mom and dad are around. And that was one of the things that I absolutely loved about being able to travel with the kids and we would go places. And we were in, you know, a lot of different places. We, we traveled out of the country with the kids. We traveled in, in a lot of different... And, and it was so neat when I was there to know that part of my role was to protect them so they didn't have to be afraid of anything. And I love that. I, I, as a dad, that makes me feel like, I'm doing my job. That's exactly how God feels. See, God as our Father wants us as His children to know that as long as we are holding His hand, as long as we stay close, that He is so close to us that we don't need to have a fear of anything. Now understand, this isn't a reckless abandonment. This isn't go jump off the roof or go do something crazy or do, do something that, is, that will be under the, the guidelines of you know, fearless stupidity. That's not what He's talking about. It's not a matter of, of, of totally abandoning common sense and a right attitude and heart. But what he is saying is he's saying, if I've got your hand, there's nothing that you need to fear. There's nothing that is going to come against you. It's a wonderful promise. And it's a promise that we should find ourselves in all of the time, knowing that God is not only able to provide and protect, but He does so in such a way that we shouldn't exercise fear over so many of the things that we're afraid of. Some of you know, and I've mentioned this quite a few times because it's like one of the only things that we do for entertainment now while we're staying around the house, we're revisiting the Waltons series. And, you know, the good night, John Boy thing. If you haven't seen it and if you want to, we'll mail them to you when we're done with them and then you can watch them. It depends on how long this goes on. But they're great. It was cast in a much more pleasant time than what we're going through right now. It was cast in the midst of the Great Depression. And so it shows this family of 11 people surviving through the Great Depression with, with just love and with, with an attitude of, of being able to sustain things in the Lord in order for them to be able to, to continue. And John Boy... One of the main characters of the, 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 the story had to do a commencement speech. And he used the famous quote that we mo know more so from, from uh, of, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. That is, in his first inauguration, when he said, the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself. And of course, if you go back and you look at the history, somebody said it before he did. But that's the one that captured the hearts and minds of those individuals at that time going through this national calamity of the Great Depression. And while it's a great encouragement, and while I think that there's a certain aspect of truth in, in, in what he was saying, we don't need to fear, and the only thing that we have that we would be afraid of is fear, but the reality is, is there is something we should fear. The only thing that we should fear is not knowing God. That's the only fear we should have as a people. The only fear that we should possibly have is not being at the beginning point of wisdom in knowing who God is because without a knowledge of God, without an acceptance and a receiving of Jesus Christ, then we are truly hopeless. But if we've come to that place to where we know God, where we call Jesus Christ Lord, we don't even have to fear fear itself. We need to fear absolutely nothing. Hebrews 13 and 5 tells us that we're to let our conduct be without covetousness, to be content with such things as we have. But listen, for Him Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Guys, you need to go there. It's Hebrews 13. Starts in verse 5. And you need to underline this. And if nothing else, you need to take this aspect of, of, of the Lord is my helper. 
I will not fear. And make that a mantra. Make that your, your prayer and your understanding. Because the Lord is your helper. There's, there's this aspect of not needing to fear what's happening and what's going on in the world. In verse 8 it says, And I will also say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him, the Son of Man, also will confess before the angels of God. But... He who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Because we should be in this place of walking so closely with Christ that we have no fear of man, then we also should have no fear of confessing Christ to man. You see, we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be those that are concerned about what people are going to think other than the fact that they need to think about their eternal destination. And so we shouldn't have... Yeah, and, and one of the things that bothers me in this culture that we've seen happen over the last probably 50 years is that for those that have got an agenda, for those that want to promote a particular cause, it seems like that there's no shame, if you will, in relationship to broadcasting their point of view, to standing up and wanting everybody to listen to the things that they want to support, the things that they want to promote, the things that, that is important to them. And the only place that I saw a reduction in this over my lifetime was in the church. The church over this same period of time was, was told, well, you've got to keep that private. That's a personal thing between you and God. Religion is personal. Don't share that with people in the workplace. Don't share it. You know, and you remember, there's two things that you're not supposed to talk about if you want to have friends, right? Religion and politics. Well, politics didn't, doesn't even make the list anymore. Everybody talks about politics. But does everybody talk about religion? Oh, and it's not just religion, it's about relationship. It's about us being willing to take and speak up for that which we believe in a bold and a fearless way. What are we afraid of? What is it possibly that we could be afraid of to look at somebody and say, you know what, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and I'm really concerned about your eternal soul. I'm really concerned about your life and you as a person and I really care about you enough to where I want to share with you the secret to, the, the reason why and the purpose behind why I believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world because you need to hear this information. Why would we be afraid of that? Well, I don't want to hear that. I don't like you anymore. Oh, Okay. We shouldn't be afraid. Hebrews 13 and 5. Oop, no, Romans, I'm sorry. Romans 1 and 16. The Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. That's us. For it is the righteousness of God, and it's where it's revealed by faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. See, everything that God offers to us is conditional. It's conditional. Oh, well, wait a minute. What about His unconditional love? Well, yeah, that stands, but the condition in order to receive that is we have to be willing to accept His terms of salvation. We have to be willing to accept Jesus Christ and place our faith in Him in order to be a recipient of the conditions of salvation. Now, we've talked a lot about what this aspect of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, and there's some confusion out there about what the one unforgivable sin is. And there's a lot of talk and a lot of different beliefs and ideas that somehow or another that certain sins are more in their, in their, their level of, 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 of unforgivingness than other sins. And that's not true. All sin in the eyes of God is sin. It doesn't matter. Now, are there things that we can recognize that are more heinous? Are there things that are, that are, that are uh, just against the whole concept of what would be good or right that are more severe? I mean, is it any different? You know, is there a difference between the guy that, 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 that breaks into the back of the church and steals the tools <laughs> as opposed to somebody that would murder somebody? Well, yeah, we can see that as a people. We see that there's a difference. But when it comes to God, all sin is equal with the exception of one. One sin is un forgivable and it's the blasphemy of the holy spirit well, what does that mean blasphemy of the holy spirit very simple is denying 
the testimony of the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. That's blasphemy. That's refusing to accept the message and that which the Holy Spirit has called, which makes perfect sense, because if you think about it, the only thing that you could stand before God and not being forgiven of and therefore find yourself separated from Him from all eternity is to reject Jesus Christ, to reject Him as the Messiah. And so Jesus says, you can even talk bad about me. You can come against the Son of Man. You can do anything you want, but if you refuse to accept what the Holy Spirit is saying in testifying that I am the Savior, you can't be saved. It will not be forgiven of you. And how important it is that we recognize so many folks are in jeopardy of being in this place of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Oh, man, they may not understand it because, see, blaspheming is a religious word. But what it is is to refuse that call. And, and if you're listening to, to me today and you've received Jesus Christ, you know that there was a time in your life where there was a knock, where there was a call, where you, where you heard within your, your heart or within your, within your mind, you heard this calling, this wooing of the Holy Spirit saying, come, you need to come, you need to reconcile yourself to the Lord, you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ. And you responded to the Holy Spirit and you said, yes! And you went from that place of death to life by virtue of accepting Jesus Christ. But for those who don't, those who continue to refuse, those who continue not to listen, that's that aspect of blasphemy. Refusing what the Holy Spirit says so clearly to every heart and every whole. Now, when they bring you to the synagogues and the magistrates and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour now do, do you see the progression here it's, it's, it's interesting because now the lord is giving his disciples especially an idea of what is about to come the things that they're going to experience he says first off i don't want you to be afraid god himself is watching out for you he is intimately involved in every aspect of your life he knows every hair on your head second he says you need to confess me before men you need to not be afraid of sharing me with others knowing that it's by virtue of you sharing with others that i will then in turn confess you in heaven and he says that i'm your i'm your advocate i'm going to back you up i'm going to i'm going to be with you every step of the way and then 30 says the holy spirit has also got your back when you need to know what to say i want you to understand that the holy spirit is going to speak through you and by you on behalf of me now what this means automatically is that if we do what jesus has told us to do up to this point in time expect controversy expect in this case to be pulled in front of magistrates and in front of officials and in front of front of authorities how many times have we found ourselves being brought into the presence of somebody who we again perceive has some sort of authority or some sort of place of, of being right and guys this is something that's going on in our, in our country right now in a way that's new and be, because we've never been put into this situation where we've been first asked not to come together for the public good and then, well, ordered for your own good, don't do this. And now it's becoming this aspect of a mandate carrying penalty on the other side. And guys, we're having trouble in this country with this stuff. There's a lot of folks that are having trouble because this is the land of the free and the home of the brave. I mean, we're, we're, we're not ready to... And, and how silly is it for us not to exercise common sense and follow that which is right and good, but yet it goes against so much. And we see this idea of being drugged before authorities. What should we say? Well, if our focus and our attention is on bringing people to the place of salvation in Jesus Christ... The argument isn't about assembly. The argument isn't about, oh, we can't have church or we can't gather for a party. or we can't. That's not the argument, especially when it comes to churches because you know what? Church is happening right here, right now, and it's happening in every home and in every heart of every believer that's listening here or listening anywhere right now where it's got their Bible open and by the power of the Holy Spirit is bringing the people of God and God's ch church together, the body of Jesus Christ. Church is happening right now. 
And I still like that thing we talked about on Wednesday night. Somebody sent me something, you probably saw it, to where the church is not empty. It's not empty. The church has been deployed. The church is out and, and about and able to reach into where, places and reach into things. Things are happening in the hearts and minds of believers right now that could not have happened absence this situation. When things are normal, things don't change. It takes shaking up. It takes things being out of the normal in order for God very often to get the attention of His people and the attention of the world that is rejecting Him. But then one in the crowd came to Him and said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But He said to him, Man, who made me the judge or the arbitrator over you? And then He said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of the things he possesses. Another place to underline in your Bibles. Another place to underline and to understand the importance of this. I love what Jesus says first. Though. He says, hey man, who made me the judge? Now we, we would think, wait a minute. This is Jesus, the Son of God. He can judge everything perfectly. Why would he refuse to judge this? Because we also know that Jesus had not come at this point in time to judge the world, but what? To save the world. You see, Jesus is in a totally different position. He's going to come back at, at a point in time when the Lord prepares and sends to be the judge, and he will judge the righteous and, and the unrighteous, and he will separate it out, and he will be that perfect and righteous judge. But at this point in time, he's not there to be the judge. He's there to be the Savior. But even so, he goes up and he says, but there's another problem here. See, the problem isn't just a matter of, is it fair that my brother won't split the inheritance? You see, the issue is covetousness. So huge in the life of man is this aspect of coveting, this aspect of desiring what other has, is it makes the top ten of God's commandments. Thou shalt not covet. With all of the commands of God's law, Jesus expanded on them from the outside compliance and the appearance of keeping the law to the matter of the heart. And here he explains the motives behind the desire to covet what others have. And this is so important. You see, so often we think that our lives are made up of the things that we have. We think the more things that we have, the more life we have. If I can just amass a larger one of these, if I can get a few more of those, if I can just get one of that, I will truly be living. So such is our human condition that there's really no attempt to conceal it. I mean, we live in a world of bling and eye candy and cars and houses and boats and toys and all of these things that are made to be indulgences in order for us to be able to be happier and to have more life. Now, don't get me wrong. I like nice things. I like a lot of the things that the Lord has allowed me to have, that has blessed me with, things that we would, we would work hard for in our life, things that we would take and, 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 and not forego the things of the Lord in order to be able to have. And the Lord wants and desires for us to have nice things as He would will in order to show us and demonstrate His blessings to His children, just like we as parents want to bless our kids. But the point and what Christ is saying is, listen, listen, this is so important. The value of your life is not found in the stuff of your life. We're more important to God than the stuff that we have. And, and it's a matter of keeping a proper perspective. And if the Lord allows me such things, it's because of His blessings. But understand, it's not where my worth as a person is. It might be what others would use to appraise my life, but not God. God finds value separate from all of the things and the stuff that I possess. Look at where Jesus goes in verse 16. He uses a parable and He speaks to them. And He says, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And He thought within Himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So He said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take 
eat your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will be those things you have, which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Jesus uses this parable to illustrate a point. He describes this rich man, somebody who already has more than enough, but he, but he just needs more room to store even more. I like watching every once in a while American Pickers. I like the show. And it's, it's fun because it's, it's, it's interesting to see some of the stuff that they come up with, but then every once in a while they come across somebody that is just so over the top in relationship to the things that they have, they have collected and that they're, they're storing and, and, and holding on to. One of them was this old guy, and when I say old, I understand we're all old, but this guy even compared to everybody that's listening to me, he was old, he was, he was getting on in years. And they went into one room, one area of this barn, and there was like every classic motorcycle known to man. Harleys and Indians and, 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 and stuff from overseas. I mean, this guy had row after row after row after row after row of all of these pristine motorcycles that he had been collecting his entire life. And then they went into another shop, and it was one that were just, well, it was a slight downgrade of all the ones that were perfect. And these were the ones that were projects and in work, but they were mostly there. And then he went over to another barn, and there was just pieces and parts of stuff laying everywhere. And you could see the pickers in there just drooling, just saying, ah, oh, we, we, we want this stuff. And the guy wouldn't let loose of none of it. He wouldn't even sell him a part from the scrapyard because he wasn't ready to let loose of it yet. He had to hang on to it. Now, the reality was is this guy was never going to get to the place of restoring any of the stuff that was in the one room He was never going to use any of the parts. If he ever did anything, he might be able to to take advantage of one or two of the pieces that were already completely perfect, maybe if he could still even ride a motorcycle. But he wouldn't let loose of it. He wouldn't let go of it. He was amassing all of these things. And I looked at my wife, and and, and, and she doesn't necessarily watch the show, but I brought her attention to it, and I said, look at all this stuff. I said, you know what? That guy's going to die And either the state or his kids are going to come in here and get rid of all of his stuff, and nobody's going to care. Nobody is going to care. His kids aren't going to care. The state ain't going to care. The people that come in and liquidate this stuff aren't going to care. This stuff is all going to go to people that have absolutely no appreciation for his entire life's work of storing stuff that had no effect on eternity. Now, I'm not faulting the guy for having a hobby. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or loving old motorcycles. But how sad it would be is that when this guy stands before the Lord at the crowning achievement of his life is that he collected a bunch of stuff. Stuff that means nothing in the kingdom of God. Then Christ returns back to his disciples and he says to them, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life or what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which they have neither storehouses nor barn. And God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Everyone needs to lock on to this, guys, with everything that we are. Therefore, do not worry about your life. The context here is very important. Jesus is talking about basic needs. He's not talking about the stuff. He goes back and he's talking about that which we would worry in consideration to what we would eat or what we would wear. Jesus says, don't worry about these things. God is going to provide those. He knows what you need. He takes care of the birds. How much more is he going to take care of you? And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? 
Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow thrown into the oven, how much more will He clothe you, O you, of little faith? What have we ever gained by worry? How many times have we allowed worry to capture our focus and distract us from everything else in life? And Jesus says, why are you worrying about things that you can't do anything about? Guys, i got to tell you what, if there was ever a time where worry has been multiplied in our culture collectively, it's now, within our lifetimes right now. And yet there are so many aspects of this that I can do absolutely nothing nothing about and the things that i can do i can do without worry i had somebody send me something and i love it i I, i'm getting encouragement and i'm sending out encouragement we're texting people and we're calling people and if you're doing that keep doing it we need to stay in touch with folks we need to be continuing to call around and ask them how they're doing and just make sure that everybody's good but i i get these things every once in a while somebody sent me something the other day and it was it was great it's like I realize that this is probably very stressful for you. I just want you to know how much I appreciate what you... And it was wonderful. It was like it was this great encouragement. But then I went back and I went, should I tell them that I'm less stressed now than normal? I mean, the reality is, I'm getting a break on a lot of stuff. I mean... There's not as much going on because we're not doing a lot. I mean, there's still a lot that happens and there's still a lot of things that go on daily here at the church and we've still got the building probably. But all that was there anyway. You know how many times I've had the opportunity to just sit down and watch an episode of the Waltons without the phone ringing or text message? It's great. And I thought, okay, I had had, had kind of a dilemma. Should I let him know I'm not stressing or should I just let him think I am so he'll keep praying harder? You see, we do what we can do. We do what we're supposed to do. We do that which is right. We do that which honors the Lord. We continue to lift in prayer. We continue to follow and do the things that we're supposed to. And in that then, all of the other stuff. See, I can't worry about what's going on in New York. I can't worry about what's going on in the economy. I can't worry about all Because you know what? I can't do anything about it. And so the Lord says, stop it. Stop trying to think that somehow or another that you need to worry about something. It's like somebody worrying about how short they are. I mean, that's what he said. You can't add a cubit to your stature. You can't be taller. Well, now you can. Now you can be taller. There's actually a, a, a cosmetic surgical procedure I saw a few years ago where they're going in and they're lengthening the bones in people's legs to make them taller. How crazy is that? How crazy is it that people will go, I want to be three inches taller, so I'm going to lengthen the bones in my leg. You're going to look weird. Because if you're long from here down and you're not long from here up, you're going to look like a giraffe or something. I mean, I don't know what's going on with that. Why don't they lengthen their necks? Do you like those people that put the rings on their necks or something? There's a lot of people that do a lot of things to try to change their appearance. And I just want to tell you, when the Lord calls us out, all of that stuff stays here. There's going to be some crazy-looking piles of stuff on the ground when it comes to all of the adornments and all of the accoutrements that we put on and in our bodies in order to be able to try to change them. And there's going to be a weird piles of stuff laying all over the ground when the Lord calls us out. But the reality is, is we shouldn't worry about that which we have no control over. Not because nothing matters. You see, don't think that it's, a, again, an abandonment of caring. This isn't that I don't care. But the Lord says we shouldn't fear the things that we can't change or the things that might try to change us that are of man. What truly matters is that God would have us to love Him and understand that He will be the one that will provide and will protect in Jesus Christ. There's nothing that anyone that can do that can override God's salvation and the plan that He has for our lives. And today, I've got, I got to tell you, I, I, it's as far as we're going to go in Scripture today. Next, uh, next time that we come together in, in Luke, we'll be moving on to one of my favorite areas of Scripture, talking about what we're to seek first 
I'll let you read ahead and figure out what it says. But I want to tell you that right now there's some things that are, that are going on that I'm very pleased with, that I'm very impressed with. I'm impressed with our president right now. I'm impressed with the leadership team that he's put together to oversee the things that are happening in the country in order to be able to meet the needs of the American people. And guys, we need to continue to pray daily for our leaders and pray for those who are served, called to serve in this time of great calamity. The assistance that's going to come for businesses and for individuals, all that's great. All these things are, are great in the way of, of hopefully providing some relief and some means of being able to sustain folks through this trial, but understanding that our help comes from the Lord. All of those things are great. It's the way that there should be responses right now to the current situation we find our in, but that's not where we place our trust. That's not where we place our faith. We need to do our part when it comes to following the best advice, following the instructions from our leaders, and at the same time making sure that it is all founded in and our trust is not in science, our trust is not in finance, our trust is not in government, our trust is in God and God alone because He is the one that is able to save. He's the one, again, as in Hebrews told us, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? I want to take a few minutes as the worship team comes back up, and I just want to take a minute and make some specific prayer requests before the Lord. And at this point in time, I also want to tell you that if you're not involved already on the prayer chain, if you're not involved in communicating to the church through the website and, and, and through other means to where we can take and we can stay in touch, that you need to do so. You also need to be in a place to where if you have a need, you need to reach out and let somebody know about that need. If you're in a place to where you can't shop, you give us a call. We'll find somebody to go shop for you. We'll find a way to be able to get stuff to you. If you need somebody to, to take and just talk to because you need encouragement or you're, you're, you're having a a bad day, you call somebody. You let us know about that because as a family, we don't want anybody to feel like they're in this alone because you're not. Even if you're not a part of this fellowship, you can come and contact us through the website. You can contact us through the prayer chain. You can come a, become a part of this body collectively in order to be able to draw from and be nurtured by the strength that comes from the people of God. God hasn't called us to do this thing alone, so don't find yourself in a place of feeling as if you are. But I want to offer up some specific prayers and then we'll close out with a song and a time of fellowship. And again, I encourage you to go forward in this week, this holy week, reading through the account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and then also through His trial, His crucifixion, His burial, and His resurrection in preparation for next Sunday.